And well, welcome to the Morro Coast Annual Christmas Bird Count Compilation Community Program for 2020. I would say we have several things on the program tonight. We're going to start out with the award of the 2020 Agron Scholarship to a deserving Quest of College student who's studying for a career in biological science. Then we're going to move on to the Morro Coast Volunteer of the Year Award. And then we have an update on the Osprey Nest platform and the Tuesday Giving Fundraising Drive. And then we have a short PowerPoint presentation on the rare to our area birds here. And then the moment you have all eagerly been anticipating the compilation for the annual Audubon Christmas Bird Count. So I hope you enjoy this evening's program. So at this point, I'll repeat, I'm going to ask you all except Amanda Hensley and Libby Agron to please mute your microphones and turn off your video. And uh, without further ado, we have been at Omora Coast Audubon Society awarding a scholarship to Cuesta College students who have been recommended by their professors to apply for aid in their studies. This scholarship is funded by the generosity of community member Libby Agron at this point. Libby, thank you very much. And Libby, if you'd like to say a few words, the mic is yours. Thank you. I'm so excited, Amanda, that you're the recipient this year. And I just want to congratulate you because this scholarship is definitely given to further your knowledge. But more important, in, in a way, it will make you the yeah, message and, and the spreader of information and help to many others. Okay. So this is just the beginning. Amanda, we look forward to you um, helping us all of us in this country <laughs> and around the world to save our, our bird population and to work with climate. And you are just the perfect candidate. So we're very proud of you. Oh, thank you so much. This means so much to me. Um, working with the professors at Cuesta College, really, it's just broadened my horizons and made me more passionate about science and what we can do today to help, you know, wildlife in general. It, everything's had such a hard time, especially, well, we have this year, but wildlife, it really has had a hard time, and I, it's just spurred me on. Things like this spurred me on to, to reach for farther, so I'm going for my BS in wildlife biology and um, veterinary tech next semester, and I'm trying to go for um, the internship at Pacific Wildlife Care to help for wildlife rehabilitation this summer. So I'm hoping that I can help some local birds, especially. <laughs> and I just, I really appreciate your recognition and the scholarship's gonna go towards furthering my, my learning and my education. So thank you so much. Great. You know, I'm gonna say a little bit more about, about Amanda. You know, we really feel it's important to encourage young scientists to pursue their studies in the biological sciences. And this year's award, some of you may remember from last year, she's a familiar name. We don't often award the scholarship to an individual two years in a row, but Amanda Hensley was renominated by her professors, Drs. Lori McConico and Silvio Favoretto, with outstanding recommendations. In addition to excelling at her studies, Amanda volunteers as a research assistant in their biology lab. She served as a TA in the Applied Marine Biological course and continues to volunteer with the Moore Bay National Estuary Program's monitoring of the eelgrass beds. They'd say that her upbeat attitude inspires those around her and helps her to make the most of her opportunity to focus on school and her own academic pursuits and professional goals as a biologist. We at Morocos Audubon Society are pleased during this pandemic when many students, including Amanda, have rather heartbreaking stories of financial struggles. We are very pleased to award this year's Agron Scholarship to Amanda Hensley. So congratulations, Amanda. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. I look forward to the bird count and I'm hoping for the Brent geese <laughs> that they went up this year, maybe, because <laughs> that relates to our eelgrass study. So, <laughs> well, I am not going to uh, let the bat cat out of the bag, but you'll see when we get there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm waiting. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So, Amanda and Libby, you should now mute yourselves and turn off your videos. And I'm going to ask Eric Weir, I assume you're here, would you please turn yourself on both video and sound? And say something when you do that so that I know you're on. I should be unmuted and 
I've turned on my video. Excellent. You know, Morro Coast Audubon is primarily a volunteer organization. We operate the 24-acre Sweet Springs Nature Preserve, the Audubon Overlook, and several other smaller properties with the help of a quarter-time employee. But everything else we do in the entire chapter is done by volunteers from the community. Were it not for the volunteers, we would not be able to accomplish, among other things, research like the Christmas bird count, the Sweet Springs breeding bird survey, the black oyster catcher nest monitoring, shorebird and brown pelican surveys, provide quality community programs and field trips, educational programs to area schools on birds, provide an effective voice on conservation issues, restoration on Morro Coast Audubon lands. We depend on our volunteers and the community has responded with both monetary donations and gifts of their time, energy, and expertise, for which we are profoundly grateful. So every year at this time, Morro Coast Audubon takes this opportunity to honor one particular, or in this case, two particularly notable volunteers for the Volunteer of the Year Award, which this year goes to Eric Weir and Laura Frank. So let me say a little bit about them. Um, Eric has been the Moore Coast Lands Chair for multiple terms. He oversees issues arising at any of the Moore Coast properties and planning the ongoing habitat restoration efforts needed. Eric and Laura attend the monthly work parties faithfully, where Eric usually functions as our required Moore Show Band snail monitor, a job that Eric has been specially trained to perform. In addition to work parties once a month, Eric and Laura often volunteer their time and expertise to complete projects the work parties have been unable to finish, including weeding and planting, trimming, watering. Eric was the lands chair during the construction of the access improvements at Sweet Springs East, bringing him in contact with construction workers, management companies, attorneys, county planning staff, landscapers, the Coastal Commission, and others needed to acquire all of the necessary permits and to complete the project. And yes, Eric also is an accomplished birder, leading many field trips over the years for Morro Coast Audubon Society and the Morro Bay Winter Bird Festival, as well as serving as a sector leader for the Christmas Bird Count. And yes, Laura is most frequently right by his side, helping guide and ID birds for others. Recently, due to a change in state law, our lands manager, once an independent contractor, was required to become the one and only Moro Coast Audubon Society employee. So, of course, Eric is overseeing this employee and was instrumental in helping to define the land manager's duties. These are actually just but a small sample of the diligent and conscientious efforts that Eric and Laura have put, on, put forth over the, over the past many, many years for the benefit of Morro Coast Audubon Society. So Morro Coast Audubon Society is proud and honored to name Eric Weir and Laura Frank as the 2020 Morro Coast Audubon Society Volunteers of the Year. So Eric, if you would like to say a few words, this is your chance. Oh, thank you, Judy. Uh, Laura and I appreciate this honor very, very much. Um, means a lot to us. We have given a lot to, um, of our time to Sweet Springs and the other Morro Coast properties, and um, but it's all always been with pleasure, and um, we're happy to have done what we've done. And um, but this feels really good, and. Um, Thank you, everyone, and we, we hope to continue our volunteer work that we do and um, long into the future. Um, Morro Coast Audubon is a great organization, and we're, we're proud to be part of it. Laura? Well, we certainly appreciate you, Eric and Laura. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, Eric, you may turn off your video now and mute yourself. And Dave Clendenin, I'm going to ask you to please unmute yourself and turn on your video and let us know when you're live. Dave? Dave Tyra, do we have Dave Clendenin on this evening? I'm looking down the list. I don't see him. 
Okay. Well, he's had a kind of a rough day today, <laughs> um, fighting with computer technology. So uh, okay. I guess I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to give you an update on the Osprey nesting platform project. And this has been spearheaded. We appointed a subcommittee of Dave Clendenin and John Roser, both of whom are avid birders and raptor authorities, having worked with both the Condor Office and the Peregrine Fund and just had a lifelong interest in raptors. So they were given the task of identifying locations that would be appropriate osprey nesting sites as places to put platforms. There are now close to 10 osprey that are resident year round in the Moore Bay Estuary, and they've actually tried building a nest on top of the Wind Walker, which is a derelict boat tied up to the Coast Guard Pier. Now, Harbor Patrol isn't thrilled about that, so Moro Bay is actually interested in helping us find sites. We, at this point, have several sites within our properties identified. One is a dead tree along the ponds, and the other one is a live cypress up near the Barbara Burke platform. And our plans are to lightly top the cypress enough to be able to put a platform at the top there. And the, the other one is to top one of that dead tree along the ponds and install those raptor nest, those, those nest platforms in the next month is what the hope is and have those ready to go by nesting season and hope to entice those raptors to take take possession of those nest platforms. The, we put out a call for $5,000. We have reached, I believe the last number I saw is around $4,300. So we are very close to that $5,000 level. We don't know exactly how much this is going to cost. Some of it will depend on how much the tree trimmers actually charge us. Some of it will depend on how much the coastal development permit actually costs. And some of it will depend on whether we can have poles and pole installation donated for the Mora Bay sites by PG&E. So $5,000 will get us well on our way. So we want to thank the community for all of their support of this and we really hope that the Ospreys appreciate all of your efforts. <laughs> okay, well, we are now to the part where I'm going to do a very short slide presentation. Um, Dave, you're going to allow me to share my screen. Is that correct? You should be good to go, Judy. Okay, good. So, a lot of you may have seen a site very similar to this sometime during throughout the year and wondered what in the world there were all those people with giant scopes and cameras doing. In this case, they were looking for the sharp-tailed sandpiper. There are a lot of birds that showed up this year that generally are not found on this part of the world, but they were. And so sometimes you'll see them on the streets, lining the streets with binoculars and cameras. And even we had an, a couple of intrepid crews that hiked the sand spit looking for the elusive common ringed plover, which had never been seen before in this area. So I'm going to give you a short slideshow to show you what this was all about. Um, the white wagtail. The white wagtail is related to pipits, and it should be in Europe and North Africa, but instead was here along the coast up near Cayucas. Barrow's golden eye usually is found, it is found farther north, but he managed to stray south this year and was found down near Pismo. Then there's the field sparrow that showed up in Jim Royer's yard. And this field sparrow was common, but he's common in the eastern US and had never been seen in this county before. Then there's the little gull. Now you're going to notice on both the little gull and on the field sparrow, and you'll see it again on the uh, one of the plovers. There's a number of these birds that have deformities. Maybe that's a reason they're along the coast. You know, I don't think we know. 
Um, the little gull is a Eurasian species, very small numbers in the Eastern US and Great Lakes area, but they should not be here. And then there's Cassin's finch. Jim Royer had a great year this year. This also showed up in Jim Royer's yard. Uh, Cassin's finch are high mountains of Western US and Canada in general. And then there was the streakback oriole. This bird brought people in from as far as I can tell, all over the United States. There were large number of birders I had never seen before. They should be in Central America and Mexico in the tropical lowlands, but this one showed up in his Lake Creek campground. Then there's the common ringed plover, cute little bird. Um, they should breed in the Arctic, but they typically cross over to the old world when migrating south. And this one took a wrong turn and came down along our coast. And then there's the sharp-tailed sandpiper. Now, this bird was in a big flock of other birds. And one of our very young teenage birders was out looking, scanning the flocks, and happened to notice a bird that looked different. And that's the key to discovering these rarities. And Will Knowlton happened to be there. And Will identified it as the sharp-tailed sandpiper. The sharp-tailed sandpiper, a uh, long-distance migrant, Siberia and Australia, New Zealand. So he is on the wrong side of the Pacific Ocean at this point. And then there was the great crested flycatcher. This was over in Morro Bay. He should be in the eastern and the Midwest woodlands. There was also the Pacific golden plover. Another one on the wrong side of the Pacific during migration should be in Eurasia. This was the third one with some sort of deformity on its, this, in this case, its leg. And then there's the emperor goose. I really wish I'd seen this bird. Um, he nests along around the Bering Sea and is usually not this far south during migration. And the last one that showed up recently was the zone-tailed hawk. I, this bird is incredible. It looks a lot like a vulture. It flies a lot like a vulture. It hangs out with the vultures and flies with the vultures. But unlike the vultures, it's a raptor and it is a hunter. And so it will dart out of its, <laughs> drop out of its, its, its flock and nail a bird and they never even see it coming thinking it's a vulture. So pretty cool bird. So that's the end of our birds, rare, rare for here birds, which takes us to our last, uh oh, what did I do with it? Takes us to our last part of the program tonight. Dave, am I, am I unsharing? I stopped share, here we go. Yeah, you're good, Judy. I'm sorry. I have to... Okay. Um, I'm looking for the rest of my, <laughs> my comments. Here we go. So at this point, um, Jay Carroll and all area leaders, you should now turn on your microphones and videos, please. So we're now, we've now come to the compilation part of the Moore Coast Audubon Annual Christmas Bird Count. For those of you who are new to count, I'm gonna give you an extremely brief history. Beginning on Christmas day in 1900, that's 120 years ago, ornithologist Frank Chapman, who was an early officer in the then nascent Audubon Society, proposed a new holiday tradition, a Christmas bird census that would count birds during the holiday rather than hunt birds. And so began the annual Christmas bird count. We have an outstanding team that has put together hours into preparing and collating results. Jay Carroll is the count compiler and area lead this year, with other area leaders being Jeff Miller, Steve Tillman, Steve McMasters, and Eric Weir. And of course, all of this was done through the internet <laughs> thanks to Joanne Assen's extreme competence with computers. So thank you, Joanne. If you have any questions during this process, please type them into the chat and Dave Tiber will ask those questions at the end, okay? So at this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Jay Carroll and the area leaders. Oh, thank you, Judy. Uh, I see Eric, I don't, is Steve, Steve is with us too, right? Yeah, I can see you. I just uh, have one question. It says, uh, 
My video won't start because the host has stopped it. I hope my family doesn't find out about this feature. Uh, yeah, well, you know, that's, that's one of the, the uh, smart features of Zoom. It, it only uh, shows the, you know, the really, really cool people. See, I'm there sorry. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay, Sorry great. about that, Steve. <laughs> that's okay. I was enjoying the anonymity there for a while. And uh, Jeff Miller is our other area leader, and he was not able to join us on the Zoom meeting tonight. So um, he sends his regards. Uh, but Judy, thank you and um, welcome. And thanks to all the volunteers for going out there in the field and um, who participated last Saturday in the, uh, in the count. We had a, uh, about, I think, 85 or so. Uh, Joanne has, or will have the exact count because she was, uh, in charge of registering and uh, set up all the web portal or the web um, pages and everything. We really appreciate that. Um, and welcome also to people who didn't participate in the count but are checking it out. And I know there are a bunch of reasons why people didn't join and uh, one of which is the COVID restrictions and we're sorry about that, but we did the best we could and uh, we got a pretty, pretty good participation um, regardless. So, um, I'm already looking forward to next year's count and hopefully we can do it, do it the way we've been doing it with the potluck and uh, the count as it, as it usually is where we have uh, an interactive audience and uh, the, the other area leaders, by the way, uh, other area leaders, Eric and, uh, and Steve, if, you're, if you can speak and you have something to say uh, later on, um, I hope you will. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, one, Small positive that came out of it is that we as the compiler area leaders had a lot more time to get the results together and we weren't quite as rushed as we usually are. Um, and so uh, we also got to stay in bird a little bit later in the afternoon, which was good. I actually went out and looked for poor wells at night, which I've never done on, during the count day. So uh, that was a small positive. Um, <clears throat> but uh, anyway, thanks very much. I know we uh, had some challenges with the pandemic uh, restrictions and so forth. So um, I'm thankful that we all um, who are out there abided by those and uh, seem to go, go fairly well. So, um, and then um, I kind of introduced our area leaders uh, already, but uh, just to say Joanne Awesome, who I call Joanne Awesome, because she is our account registrar and communications chair and we really couldn't do this whole thing uh, without her. It's a, definitely a team effort and with all the other volunteers too. Um, and Eric Weir, continuing to volunteer as the volunteer of the year. And, <laughs> and this year is no exception. Uh, Steve McMasters, uh, who is the, um, he, he was in our San, San Luis Obispo uh, sectors and managed those very well. And um, Steve Tillman, who doesn't live in the count circle, but he's, we let him in anyway, just to be an area leader. And he did an admirable job of that. Um, when we get to the count, um, actually counting down the species that we did see, I'd like each of the area leaders to kind of chime in if they want to, or maybe just say a, a word or two about the, uh, what they did during the count day and uh, maybe a couple of the species that they saw that were notable. And then Jeff Miller, uh, who I mentioned, um, he's like, well, he's probably the most enthusiastic birder that I know of. He's just like always out there at the crack of dawn and he loves to bird. And uh, I'm sorry he couldn't join us for the meeting tonight, but uh, um, he did send a missive from the uh, Cuesta Ridge during the count. And apparently while we were enjoying relatively nice conditions down here in the 90, percent of the count circle that was uh, uh, down at lower elevation. He and Norm Pillsbury were up battling bitter cold winds and uh, freezing, you know, freezing temperatures up there. And uh, he told me that uh, he wasn't really complaining, but he was saying um, he thought Ernest Shackleton had it a little bit easier. So, <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he's tough and they did get some good birds up there. So. <clears throat> 
and that those those dry winds and the, the fact that it's been so dry, uh, a lot of uh, uh, people commented that they thought the numbers of birds were down this year noticeably, and that's you know likely due to the dry conditions for one, um, and then also I think those are catastrophic wildfires that we've been having in California in, in the summertime. Those likely had some effect as well, and probably won't know the extent of that uh, for some time, but um, uh, I think that probably affected some of our local local uh, birds as well. Um, Jay, if I just might chime in. Sure. Um, that's one great reason for doing these Christmas bird counts, is that, you know, we have long-term data and they Absolutely. can compare from year to year. Just thought I'd throw that in. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. And, you know, uh, a lot of people, most people are familiar, familiar with eBird in our, in our uh, groups here and use it frequently. And that is an amazing data set because it includes uh, bird abundances basically all over the world. Um, and uh, it's a huge data set, but it doesn't have the long, long, long term like the Christmas bird count does, which goes back decades. And uh, eBird is relatively new on the scene, but uh, yet the Christmas bird count, you know, has, has its place as a uh, very useful data set. So um, that's another, another reason we're glad everybody participates. <clears throat> so there's actually about 140 um, count circles, similar to ours, the 15 mile radius or 15 mile diameter count circles in California. And there's about 2,500 or so that are throughout North America and then um, a few other places uh, down in uh, Caribbean and so forth. But of those 140 or so count circles, I think uh, 40 of them decided not to do their count this year. So um, there, that was uh, you know, down because of the COVID restrictions primarily. But um, um, anyway, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky because we have a count circle. We always rank pretty high in the California uh, numbers of species that we get. And a lot of that, San Diego is like, probably the number one, and then Santa Barbara is not far behind. And we're kind of right up there as well with the numbers of species that, that we see during our count because, well, we have such great habitat around here. We have a diversity of habitats all the way from the, the ocean to the, the mountains and uh, the inland freshwater like Laguna Lake and so forth. So uh, that combined with our dedicated and very talented birders that are out there, uh, that's one of the reasons that we typically get quite a few species. And I think our average is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 200. I don't know what the exact average is for the last, you know, like say 20 years, but we get a fair number of species and uh, that's what we're gonna explore tonight. And uh, I think, uh, let's see, is there anything else, uh, Eric or Steve, Steve McMasters or Steve Tillman uh, that you wanna add right now? Um, Otherwise, I can see if I can share the screen here and get to the actual countdown, which is a little different than we normally, a lot different than we normally do because I'm just standing up in front of the group and I'm like asking people what they saw and marking it down as we go. But what I have here is an Excel spreadsheet. And on the left here, I have the, uh, the field checklist, our Morrow Field CBC checklist in order uh, that you would see it on the actual printed checklist itself. And um, I added a few photos that I took over here. I literally took them. I took them right off the Birds of the World website. And so um, I, I didn't really actually take the photos, but these are just kind of some representative species to fill in the page and let you know where we are in the count. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just simply put a put an X in the column next to each species, and then through the magic of technology, we won't have to use like a clicker counter and like hash marks and that sort of thing to see what kind of spe how many species that we actually saw. So for example, we did have a greater fr white-fronted goose in Morro Bay, so I put an X in that column. Down we go. 
species total changes to two, magic. And uh, snow geese, we did see some snow geese. Uh, not exactly sure where, whether those were in the bay or at Laguna Lake. Uh, that was Laguna, Laguna Lake, <clears throat> Adam. Oh, okay, thank you, Steve. And is that the same for the Rosses? No, Rosses was somewhere else in, in my area, but I'm not sure, I would have to find out from the team. Oh, okay. And that was Tiffany Little's group that I believe found that. Um, okay. So, and I believe it was near Cal Poly, so I'm wondering if it wasn't some of the ponds. I haven't had a chance to follow up with her yet. Okay, excellent. And now uh, John Roser, who uh, Judy uh, mentioned earlier, he went out a couple of days before the count and did a specific count in Morro Bay just for the Brant geese, which are migratory geese, of course. And he came up with a number of 642, which uh, I was just looking at our numbers over the past few years, and that is the highest count since 2011 when we had 784. So in answer to Amanda's uh, question, the numbers of Brant geese have been increasing and we think that it's largely due to the uh, increased abundance of eelgrass as well. So that's, that's a good thing. And John also mentioned that uh, back at the early 2000s, uh, there were up in the neighborhood of 4,000 to 4,500 geese that he saw. So there's a long way to go before the population, uh, at least the, the ones that are stopping here in Morvay, um, recover. And uh, this is not necessarily indicative of the entire population because I think the, and John would be able to correct me or maybe one of the other area leaders, but the overall population of the Brant geese are not um, declining in, in great numbers. They might be stable or actually increasing in certain areas. So anyway, they have a fairly wide distribution. Cackling goose was another one that we did get. Uh, a lot of candidates. Again, we, we don't actually know what the numbers are going to be here until we finish our compilation. So we have quite a bit of work to do over the next days and weeks to verify the identities of uh, some of these species that were that were observed, and then get the get the numbers, which I will eventually, uh, probably in late January, send off to National Audubon uh, to uh, be part of the national database. <clears throat> uh, Wood duck, anybody? I didn't hear of any wood duck reports. Did anybody see a wood duck? Not by, from by the way, if any of the people that are on the, the meeting, uh, the Zoom meeting now, um, saw any of these species, so you could actually type it in in the chat that, oh yeah, um, there was a wood duck here or there, so uh, for example. But um, for now, I think that was one that we did miss. Gadwall, yep. Eurasian widgeon, there's uh, two or three of them in the bay here. So uh, we usually get, get a handful of those. American widgeon, love the way they sound. We got a bunch of those. Mallard, yes, of course, mallard. Um, I just wanted to say one thing about the mallard. Oops, let's back up. Um, and that is, and back in 2018, um, we had a sighting of a type of a mallard in San Luis Creek in 2018. Curtis Morantz, who's an uh, expert birder and used to live here in San Luis Obispo County and actually participated this year as well. He saw this particular individual in San Luis Creek downtown and it was swimming with a few mallards. And, you know, I and probably most of us would have just passed it over as a female mallard, but he noticed that. It, the bill on this particular bird is characteristic of a male mallard. It's got, it doesn't have the band over the, over the, over the, um, the bill and it's kind of, a, it's yellow, it's not orange. So uh, that kind of tipped him off. He took some photos and he knew that the Mexican duck was uh, considered a subspecies of, of the mallard. But it turns out that in 2020, this year, uh, the, the, uh, ABA uh, or AOS, which is the American Ornitho Ornithological Society, they elevated Mexican duck to its own species. So we gained a species. And so, so in 2018, our total was 204. And with the addition of Mexican duck, it was 205 for 2018. So I thought that was pretty cool. 
where are we? Blue winged teal. We're going to go faster. We're just up to 10, I know. But, <clears throat> uh, blue winged teal, yep. Cinnamon teal, northern shoveler. These are all common winter waterfowl here in Morro Bay. Uh, canvasback, not, not so much common, but we did get those. And ringneck ducks, they are typically a little bit more attracted to freshwater and small, small freshwater ponds, and so those were there. Um, we had an initial report of greater scop, but we're still trying to uh, see whether it was maybe a, a greater or lesser. And for now, they're going to go down as greater slash lesser scop. So uh, I don't think we had any verified greater scop. Uh, at least that's the word that I got from uh, from the Vons and I think Tom Tom as well, who saw saw some in Morro Bay that looked like they were pretty good for graders, but we're reserving that for later. Lots of lesser scop, of course. Um, yeah, and so anyway, you'll see these blue blue highlighted or filled um, cells here that indicate that it's a, it's a complex of species. And so if we can't identify something to a species, we'll go to a higher category. And in this case, uh, uh, the scop spa, uh, it's not one that we would count on the count as a species because we already have lesser in there. Um, so we just skip over that one. Uh, surf scoter, yes. And we had, I think Greg Smith saw a white wing scoter out at Montaigne de Oro. Yes. So that was a that was a good a good sighting. We don't always get those. That's good. So again, we don't we'll just skip by the scoter spa. Lots of buffalo, oops, lots of buffalo head. And um, there were uh, some common golden eye in Morro Bay, and Jim Royer uh, saw those. Hooded mergansers, what beautiful birds. Look here, we have a photograph of one on the right. And the males are just amazing. It's just a really spectacular bird. See, we get those, I think, in Laguna Lake as well. Yes, we did. I uh, don't know that a common merganser was seen uh, on the count. I uh, don't didn't have any reports to that, but the red-breasted uh, definitely ruddy duck. Okay, so away from the ducks and starting out on some terrestrial birds here for a moment anyway. Uh, mountain quail. Ah, uh, did we? I don't think we got a report yes, of mountain we quail. Did. Oh, we did. Yes, Bill Haas, um, um, Perfumo Canyon area. Really. Wow. I, I well, asked him about it because awesome. he, he had no no California quail, but two mountain quail, and he said he heard them distinctly. Sweet. Yeah, Bill's a good birder, and he, he did our owl counts up there, too. So, And he had some other uh, good species as well. So uh, that's sweet. Good. I'm glad we got that. Um, California quail, sure. Oh, boy, wild turkey. Certainly a lot more of those lately, aren't there? Um, they can be a little bit of a nuisance, but uh, they're fun to watch. Into the loons now, red-throated loon. Yes, Pacific. Yes, we had common loon, of course. Pied bill grebe, a little photo of them on the right here. A great little mm -hmm. bustle in the back there and the red eye. That's a eared grebe, James. Oh, eared grebe, sorry. Thank you. I'll, I'll put an X on there. And we had horn grebe and eared grebe. Western Grebe and Clarks. This is often a category that we use in the fields, Clark's Western, especially if the birds were quite distant. Um, don't see Brad Schramm was doing our um, Sea Watch, and I don't remember him mentioning Fulmar or City Shearwater. No, but he, he didn't. But he did get black finned, he did have black finned shearwaters. Yes. Uh, cormorants. Lots of branch cormorants. They breed on the offshore rocks here in the summertime, as do the uh, double crested or more of a uh, arboreal nesters up in the trees. And then the pelagic cormorants, they nest on the cliff faces here. So they each, they all nest here in the county, but they all have little different niches when they're nesting. So that's kind of interesting. Um, American white pelicans. 
had a few of those in Morro Bay. I don't know, there, were there some also, Steve, do you know, on Laguna Lake? Yeah, we have them in Laguna Lake as well. Okay, great. Brown pelicans, um, bittern. Uh, does any, do anybody hear of a uh, bittern being seen? No, sometimes they show up at Laguna or even Cal Poly, but I didn't get any reports this time, so. Uh, great blue heron, of course, the great egret, snowy egret, green heron, here we go. Uh, yes, we did get green heron at Cal Poly, I do believe. And they show up at Laguna Lake as well. Black crowned night heron, yes. Turkey vulture, of course, osprey, white-tailed kites. Um, Someone saw an aggregation of a dozen or so of those. Um, they're kind of eruptive in their abundance sometimes when the rodent populations are uh, increased or decreased in areas, they'll tend to follow those rodent populations. So there's not much grass to cover up the rodents now, so they get a good bird's eye view of what they want to eat there. Um, Northern Harriers, yes. Sharp shins, mostly are winter, winter exhibitor. Coopers, yes. Red-shouldered, red-tailed. Oh, and uh, Dean Thompson's group that does uh, Cal Poly and Camp San Luis area, they saw ferruginous, but he said that they saw a dark phase ferruginous, which is this photograph right here. And that's a pretty rare uh, morph dark, uh, of, the, uh, of the ferruginous hawk, most of the light the light morph, and um, so that's it. That was a very, very cool sighting. Um, I, di I didn't see the photo, but um, I believe I believe them. <laughs> they have some good birders in that group. And golden eagle, yeah. There's always a few golden eagles around. <clears throat> Virginia rail, yes. Sora, lots of coots, plovers and sandpipers, black-bellied plover, yes. Snowy, we had, I think about 75 out on the sand spit, as well as semi-palmated, kill deer. I was trying to, uh, there was a snipe that I saw, uh, I, I did uh, uh, an area out here in Los Osos and out by the cemetery, there was, a, um, there was a snipe and it was, I was trying to get a little closer to it to uh, take a photo and every time I got within about like 200 feet of the thing, all these killdeer would just go crazy and take off and everybody would fly. And it's like, uh, I think Marlin called the killdeer panic birds. I mean, it's avid. Here's an avocet. Yes, black oyster catcher. Wimbrel, yes. Long-billed curlew, marbled godwit. Uh, ready turnstone. Um, this is one that we didn't get on count day but there was a report of one yesterday or the day before out at Montaña de Oro. So that's one we missed, but that will be included in the handful of birds that we saw on count week, but not on count day, which would also in, um, yeah, include a few, a few others. The zone tail hawk um, was the one we missed on count day. Black turnstones, yes. And didn't get a report of surf birds from Montaña de Oro. Eric, did you hear of anybody seeing a surf bird out there? No, but there is still one possibility because I haven't heard from the group that did uh, Point Bouchon. Oh, area. okay. That's, it's possible, but not likely. Okay. Um, red knots, there's a few of those out there in their winter plumage. Sanderlings, yeah, lots of those. Dunlins and uh, least sandpipers, thousands of those mixed in with western sandpipers. And here's a short billed dowager. I want to, want to draw you to your attention of the photograph here. Tom, Tom Adele took this photo. And uh, when I was going through the photos on the, uh, the Birds of the World page, this was the one of the first ones that popped up on the Birds of the World. And it's Tom's photo from right here. So that's pretty cool. Long-billed dowager. Again, these are um, mostly in the wintertime told by their, by their calls, their different calls. And so they're, they're so similar. A lot of the dowagers that we see in the bay, we just uh, give it a dowager spa. 
Wilson snipe, I mentioned we have a few of those um, throughout the count circle. They're really cool birds. Uh, red phalarope, I don't recall Brad saying that he saw a red phalarope out there. <clears throat> Spotted sandpipers, um, regular here in the winter. Uh, no wandering tattlers either. That's another rocky shoreline bird that um, is kind of unusual, but uh, we do get them from time to time. Uh, okay, greater yellow legs, yes. Willet, yes. Uh, Jaeger, no, uh, although we did have that for count week. Common mirror, uh, that's one that uh, Brad did get. And uh, also Greg Smith, I should say, was he was out scoping as well from the from the uh, cliff up there in in Montaigne de Oro. I didn't hear about Casson's auklet being seen, but rhino auklet was. <clears throat> uh, Bonaparte's uh, did not get a report of Bonaparte's this time, but certainly Herman's. And there's a few mew goals out there. Ringbilled, that's our photo representative of the goals. I like ringbill goals. They're nice, compact, very adults, very neatly marked. California goal, yes, we did get herring goal. And um, I don't think there were any Thayers reported. Uh, Jim Royer, a week or so ago, did have one in Baywood. Um, but I don't, we didn't see one on count day to my knowledge. Western, of course, and Western gulls are the only gull that nest in the breed here in the county. So they have that distinction among the gulls. In wintertime, we get a lot of species, but in the summertime, um, as far as breeders go, Westerns are the, are the only ones. Glocka swing, yes. Black leg kittiwake, no. Uh, Caspian tern, yes. Royals, yes. Forster's turn. Rock pigeon, we're down to the pigeons and the owls here. Oh, we're at 93. Getting to that triple digit number here. <laughs> I think we'll make 100 this time. Uh, rock pigeon, yes. Spantail, of course. Eurasian collared dove. Uh, we first saw Eurasian collared doves in the late 70s. Here, or at late 70s, late it's like 1997, the late 90s, and they increased almost exponentially until about 2011, and then they declined, and then they went back up, and now they seem to be kind of on the decline again. So, um, we'll, that's a that's a benefit of this long-term data set um, is, is uh, tracking the abundance of something like that, which is an introduced introduced species. <clears throat> Okay, uh, greater roadrunner, yeah. Someone got had a greater roadrunner. I don't recall where it was. We Herb uh, Elliott, who is our Laguna Lake uh, expert, got a uh, got a greater roadrunner there. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, barn owls, there are a few of those out there. Uh, we had a report of western screech owl. Maybe that was Bill Haas. Yeah, Bill Haas. He had seven pairs. Is that right? Oh, yeah. wow. That's awesome. Uh, Buboes, great horned owls. Yep. Uh, don't know about northern pygmy owl. Um, Bill didn't get it. Okay. Uh, burrowing owl. Yeah, we had, uh, we had a few of those. Um, not in their usual places uh, off Turry Road, but uh, there were some behind Camp San Luis and elsewhere. Uh, spotted owl, I think um, Bill also got a spotted owl, or uh, more than one spotted owl up there in uh, Sea, sea Canyon. Yeah, I think it was one. One? Okay. Long-eared owl did not get a report of long-eared owl. Short-eared, yeah, for sure, over off Turie Road is a good spot for those up on the uh, State Park property. And I think we did get a northern sawwet. Yeah, Bill got northern sawwet. Yeah. And, you know, even though the, the evening was uh, relatively kind of warm and calm, both John Roser and I went up to Monta Montaigne de Oro and uh, we uh, looked in two different canyons um, 
East Hazard Canyon, and I took uh, the Coon Creek area, and neither one of us saw a common poor well, and we thought maybe we would, but that's a hit and miss, depending on the, they're up there, but they weren't out and about. White-throated swift, yeah, we got those. Um, all right, hummingbirds, ton of Anna's hummingbirds. I always like to see what the numbers are in the county, in the count circle, you know, it's up, you know, hundreds sometimes, which is kind of cool to think about. Uh, yes, we had uh, at least the Rufus Allens up at the uh, nursery, uh, Los Osos Valley Nursery here. And again, here's a, here's a species that's uh, what we call slash category. It's like two, two possible species. And uh, they're really, uh, unless you have them in hand, they're really difficult, the two species, the Allens and the Rufus to tell apart. These are most likely the Allens hummingbirds here, the sedentary subspecies that's found year round in uh, Santa Barbara area. And I think that the, the one up here is also in Allens, but we don't have enough uh, uh, good identification photos to make that call. But it still counts as a species because we saw neither full Rufus or full Allens. So X that one off. Belted Kingfisher, yes. Acorn Woodpecker, Red-Breasted Sapsucker. Here's the photo on the right. Yes, Nuttles, and Downy and Harry as well, and Northern Flickers, other woodpeckers. Kestrel, yes, Merlin, yeah, that's what we see in the wintertime down here. Peregrine Falcons, I don't know what the count was. That's always interesting to see within the count circle how many peregrines that we, that we get. They're one of the ones that sometimes get overcounted though because they, they cruise around and they like, and it's goes, they fly so fast in, in so many different locations that sometimes they get double counted. So we have to uh, kind of watch for that. Uh, yeah, I had a prairie falcon. Uh, maybe there's some others seen as well um, in the other sectors. Black Phoebe, yes. Say's Phoebe, yes. Casson's kingbird. That's a species that's uh, in, increasing in numbers over, over the last few years for sure. Uh, loggerhead shrike. Here's a photo there. Just a cool bird. Still waiting for that northern shrike to show up. <laughs> Hutton's vireo. Yep. Stellar's jay. I'm kind of partial to the jays. Scrub <laughs> jay. Uh, Yellow-billed magpie. Don't, don't, uh, there's a few of them. Uh, I think uh, Ron Rupert got yellow-billed magpie up in uh, like uh, up in the uh, San, uh, San Bernardo Creek root drainage up there. Lots of crows. Horned lark, yes. Swallows, most swallows fly south, right, for the wintertime, but few around. Tree swallows, didn't hear about violet green. Anybody hear a violet green report specifically? No. Okay, into the passerines here. Chestnut back chickadee. <clears throat> yep. Oak titmouse, bush tits. Red breasted nuthatch. We had, um, they showed up early and I think they've stuck around pretty well. They're not here every winter time. But I'm wondering whether those fires in the, the, uh, the mountains uh, had an effect on things like. Uh, siskins and uh, nuthatches and other other uh, montane birds that uh, had their habitat um, partially partially uh, destroyed. So uh, white-breasted nuthatch, yes. Uh, we had brown creeper and the wrens. Gotta love the wrens. Rock wren, yes. Canyon Wren, there seems to be a resident one out at Morrow Rock. That's, uh, that's always pretty much a sure thing. If you're patient, you can hear them singing that lovely song. House Wren, yes. Pacific Wren, Eric, you, got, you, you and Laura got uh, Pacific Wren in Coon Creek, right? Yes, we, we went out Tuesday before the count and had one in one location and then, you know, thought we had it figured out. So we get there and play its calls and crickets don't hear anything and um, so then we ended up you know going almost to between the last couple bridges and 
tried again where the habitat looked right and and one piped up and Laura got a photo and oh sweet so we were we were relieved somebody else got one yeah and then Jim, Jim Royer had one at Peach Award. oh yeah okay yeah they're they're skulky little birds but um that's that's cool glad you got that one Marsh Wren yes and Buicks is always here uh didn't hear any reports of golden crown kinglets. Here's our ruby crown over here with his crest, like really, you know, it's been really agitated. I don't think I've ever seen them with that much of a red crest, but uh, occasionally when they're agitated, they'll, the males will erect that, erect that crest there. But uh, yeah, so uh, no golden crowns that I'm aware of. Uh, maybe over on uh, Black Hill and Morro Bay, I might go over there tomorrow just to see if we can get them for count week anyway. Definitely the ruby crown right there. Uh, blue gray gnat catcher, what is, yes. What is, what is what you call the female ruby crown? Uh, say, you have a, what's that? You have a I think, nickname. Is, isn't the crown just uh, the ruby crown kinglet? Isn't it just the male that has the ruby crown? Yeah, but I like your name for the female. What's that? Queenlet. Oh, the queenlet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kinglet and queenlet. I guess, did I say that? Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, Western Bluebird. Um, did we get Mountain Bluebird? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Bill had them. Bill got a lot of good stuff. Wow. Excellent. And uh, Hermit Thrush. There's a lot of Hermit Thrushes around. Mm -hmm. Doing their warping. Uh, robin, yes, and buried thrush is another one that's uh, kind of an eruptive species of sorts. And uh, I th there were some of those seen, especially like I think Bill up in Sea Canyon and Perfumo, that's a good spot for the, mm -hmm. for the buried thrushes. I forget what year it was, uh, a few years ago. They were, they were pretty, pretty common. Well, I wouldn't say common common, but just in proper habitats, so you see quite a few of them. So uh, some years we don't see them at all. Uh, Rin tit, yes, mockingbird, cow thrasher, European starling, pipits, a lot of pipits around now as well. Cedar waxwings, yes. On to the warblers, orange crowned. Uh, Nashville, Karen Perry had a Nashville in her backyard, um, which is great. And common yellow throat. You know, one thing with the common yellow throat that uh, is that, well, it's common and uh, we have it here year round, but like a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, warblers um, and uh, neotropic species that this like only really gets into the upper tier states in the U.S. in the summertime and then the bulk of the population migrate south down into Mexico, Central America. And so we're kind of in the sweet spot here. And so, you know, populations, they go north, you know, for the summer and south for the winter, and we're kind of like right in the middle. So we don't normally think of them as real migratory, but there's uh, numbers of them that pass through that aren't the, the resident ones here. All right, uh, yellow rump warbler. So for this one, we just tick one of these, even though we see both Audubon's and Myrtle. Uh, no reports of black-throated gray that I'm aware of. Certainly Townsend's and then uh, Jim Royer had the, had the uh, hermit coming to his um, hummingbird feeders when we were looking at the field sparrow there. So that, that's one that's been um, present at, at his place for a while. And uh, Wilson's, there was some report of Wilson's warblers, which are kind of hit and miss for the count as well. Lark Sparrow, yes, we're up to 162. Fox Sparrow, mostly the sooty race. And Dark Eyed Junko, yes. So we did get slate colored Juncos. Um, I saw one uh, over at Elephant Forest, and I know there was reports of one, I think at Laguna Lake and uh, uh, maybe in San Luis too, Steve McMaster. Yeah, I, I think we had one out at the uh, San Luis Cemetery. Yeah, well. yeah. So yeah, this is uh, slate colored one of these days. Uh, that group might uh, 
might be its own species, who knows, uh, depending on what kind of uh, genetic and um, breeding bird studies are done, that one could possibly split off. And actually both, both the Oregon, which is group, which is our, our typical one and the slate colored, those are comprised of subspecies themselves. And so almost all of these birds have subspecies that are assigned to them, but those are mostly reserved for like uh, ornithology collections and details, small, small details in their uh, populations that may not be apparent in the field, but different measurements of their bill sizes and uh, wing lengths and that sort of thing. So uh, it's kind of interesting to keep that in mind, but it's nice to see the slate coloreds here come, come in, in the winter time. And white-throated sparrow over here, that's another one that is a cool winter bird that we get. Lots of white crowns, ton of white crowns, lots of golden crowns. Uh, we did get a bell sparrow. It was over off uh, kind of near Shark Inlet in uh, the State Park Montana de Oro area there. So uh, that, was, that was a good one for us in the chaparral there, not necessarily up on Cuesta Ridge is where we would normally see them. Savannah sparrows, yes, song sparrow. Oh, savannah sparrow, also there was the long-billed savannah sparrow, which is a, a subspecies long-billed, large-billed, sorry, large-billed savannah uh, that uh, was seen as well. So we like to keep track of that subspecies as well. Uh, Lincolns, yes, no swamp sparrows this year, as far as I know. Um, I had one last year in the particular area that I did, the sector, and I tried looking for it, of course, and it wasn't there. And I know Jim Royer especially um, keeps tabs on the swamp sparrows here in, um, here in Baywood, Los Osos area, and didn't uh, report any this year either. So I don't know, they're missing an action. Uh, Rufus crown sparrow, yes. Spotted towhee. Um, if you miss the uh, Rufus sided towhee, common name, uh, write to the American Ornithologist Union and express your displeasure. I don't know why they changed that, but there was some good reason behind it. No Western tanagers that I, we had one for Count Week over in the campground at Morro Bay, but um, I, don't re, I don't think there were any reports of others. All right, red winged blackbird, of course, tricolored blackbirds. Cal Poly is a good spot for those. and. Some we're seeing out there, Western Meadowlark. Eric, I'm gonna call on you, it just popped into my head. I'm gonna call on you to um, do your imitation of a Western Meadowlark call. Can you wet, wet your lips and do that? Yeah, that's good enough. Anyway. Don't quit, Maybe not my best every Don't quit your day job. What was I saying? You already did quit okay. your day job. Oh, anyway. <laughs> uh, Brewer's blackbird, yes. Great tailed grackles. Um, it's another species that's kind of gone through some ups and downs. Um, never used to be here in the county, and then it uh, expanded the populations northwards, and there are quite a few, and now there's not quite as many around. Brown headed cowbirds. Purple finch, yes. House finch, yes. And pine siskins, we mentioned those earlier. There are a ton of pine siskins and um, the cone crops in some of the northern tier states in Canada and so forth, apparently there was a cone crop failure. It's a cyclical thing. And so they fly off in search of uh, better feeding areas and there happen to be a lot of them around here. Uh, if you have a, a thistle feeder with Niger seed in it, you'll undoubtedly be seeing lots of uh, pine siskins right now. Uh, lesser goldfinch, yes. Uh, there was a Lawrence's goldfinch, I think reported for count week, but I don't think there was a report for count day. And American <clears throat> goldfinch, yes. House sparrow, and last but not least is our introduced and uh, somewhat naturalized scaly-breasted munia, which used to be called the nutmeg mannequin. Oops. And those have been increasing as well. There's a bunch of them like 
dozens and dozens and dozens of Round Laguna Lake. I know that. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, we're up to 187 <clears throat> number of species that we've seen. That's pretty darn good, considering considering that we missed a few ones that we thought we would get. But um, now we're going to go on to some of the additional species. Um, normally, we would each be during the uh, potluck dinner checking our uh, compilation sheets, each of the area leaders. And hmm, well, that just automatically did it. Wasn't supposed to do that. 188. I was going to put an X in there, and that was, should have done it. Well, look, they're going. It's doing it automatically now. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we have the um, redneck grebe here. I have the four-letter codes, four-letter band codes for each of these species. That these are ones that um, we. Uh, got reports of these additional species here. So I'll just tick down this list here. And uh, this was the redneck grebe that uh, Tom uh, reported in Morro Bay and it was here for count day. Bald eagle, yes. Um, so we're actually on 190 right now. For some reason, my little program thing uh, messed up. So where ancient mirrorlet is actually 190. So Steve's other area leaders, check me on this, all right. The 190 includes the um, mirrorlet. Yellow-bellied sapsucker is 191. Red nape. Jay, you're at, you're, you're at, you're correct. The, the number's correct. You just hadn't hadn't gone on when you're on the Munia, you you underreported by one because you didn't you didn't scroll. It doesn't count till you go to the next one. Down. Okay, so so we're good then. Yes, you are. Oh, good. okay, great. I was going to double check that, but thanks for thanks for checking me on that. Hey Jay, on the yellow bellied sapsucker, I, um, this was the first one that I recall that we had actually three of them in all in sectors in San Luis Obispo. So wow. San Luis Obispo is becoming the, I guess, wintertime home. You know, maybe they're um, vacationing here or something. But um, <laughs> yeah, we had them in three different sectors. Oh, that's that's uh, that's unusual. It's unusual to have one, but to have uh, three of them, that's that's really cool. Okay, and then the red nape sap sucker. Sometimes uh, reports of the red nape will be actually hybrids between the red naped and the um, other sap sucker. Help me out. Red breasted. Red breasted. Thank you. But uh, these, uh, the one that was reported, didn't show hybrid characteristics. So we're going to count that red nape sap sucker. Uh, tropical kingbird. Here's a photo of it. Um, there were up to three of them at Laguna Lake, I do believe. At least there was a. Uh, it was thought that there were at least three. There were at least two for sure, and uh, and maybe a third one. So that's really cool. Uh, probably one of them keeps coming back every winter. Great, great bird is the tropical kingbird. <clears throat> Common raven. We see those uh, getting a little bit more abundant. It used to be very, very rare on uh, this side of the Santa Lucia's, but now they actually breed, have bred on uh, on Turie Road up on one of the transmission towers there. Hmm. Barn swallow. Yes, we had a report of barn swallows or swallow. Uh, Cassin's vireo. Um, most of the vireos, uh, other than the Hutton's vireo, are very migratory, and it's unusual to see a Cassin's here. And I think uh, Bill Haas had that individual. And also, we have a Cassin's finch, which is right here. And that's a, a, a really cool bird, um, Jim. He noticed that it had his feeder. This is a male. And uh, when uh, Curtis was up here, he was uh, staking out the feeder there. Uh, he saw the female. And I think Will Knowlton actually saw two males there. And in addition to that, Bill Haas had a Cassin's Finch up, uh, up Perfumo Canyon. So they're around. Um, they look very similar to purple finches, unless you're looking 
closely at them and they could be confused with purple finches. So there's probably some more around. This is a montane species again that we uh, would only normally find up on the grade. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Green-tailed towhee. Greg Smith had a green-tailed towhee here in Los Osos. Good, good call. Mike Stiles also had a uh, green-tailed towhee in his yard, but I think that flew the coop before the uh, count day. 198, okay. And Brewer Sparrow was another one that Bill Haas found. Um, any kind of spazellas, we do, we do get uh, some here, but the uh, Brewer Sparrow is very unusual. It's usually a chipping sparrow, which is the next one down here is our, is our representative or the spazellas here. And that is the Brewer Sparrow was 200. All right, chipping sparrow is 201. Grasshopper sparrow from Chumash uh, Trail over off of Turry Road. Uh, Mike Stiles identified that too. It's 202. Uh, yellow headed blackbird. Uh, Kath Ann Lynch found one on uh, Los Osos Valley Road near the La Familia Ranch there. And we had some reports earlier in the month from Cal Poly too, so, or maybe it was late November, but uh, there's some of those around, yellow-headed blackbirds. And then finally, uh, at the Los Osos Valley Nursery, um, we had a hooded oriole, immature bird, and also a couple of bullocks orioles, and I know bullocks orioles were seen also in other locations around Laguna Lake and, uh, and uh, maybe some, a couple other places as well. So unless mm -hmm. I messed up or we have additional species, uh, which we usually do, we have ones that uh, we have to take off the list for one reason or another, the identification wasn't uh, confirmed or sometimes we have others to add. Um, our species total for this uh, 67th count is 205, which is Hey Jay, you're Excellent. missing one. What's that? Um, the western flycatcher, the pack slope or cordillarian that I had. Oh, awesome! Thank Here, you. The one I found, you left it off. Well, I was. I just want to see if you're paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it was that a? Did you hear it vocalize, or is that? No, a, no. So it would probably go down as western because it didn't vocalize. Okay. The western uh, flycatcher, which these are these are common here in the summertime. They're exceedingly rare in the wintertime. They've all flown south. Um, used to be the western flycatcher, and then that uh, was split into the Cordilleran flycatcher to the east, and then the Pacific Slope, uh, which is uh, on the Pacific side of the mountains. So there we go. Can anybody think of anything else, Steve Tillman or Eric? No. And uh, I had, thanks John over here because this is John Casson, and he lends his name to a lot of species. He was a ornithologist from the uh, middle 1800s uh, out of Philadelphia and the Philadelphia Academy of National Sciences was the largest bird collection in in North America at the time, and he was the curator, and he was a world famous uh, ornithologist. He got the Casson's Vireo, the Casson's Finch, the Casson's Kingbird, on and on. So anyway, just wanted to show him a little love there. Thanks, John. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there are a few count week species that we've tallied so far. Um, notably, the zonetail hawk, which is a great, which is a great addition. Too bad we didn't get it on count day, but oh well. And uh, Ruddy Turnstone, there was a report later on. Northern Pygmy Owl, Palm Warbler, Western Tanager, Lawrence's Goldfinch, and a Jaeger. So um, I'll write up a short uh, compilation of the count here, and um, I'll send that out to uh, the MCAS and notify people what our count tally was. And then uh, one more thing I'd like to uh, mention to you is that we have another count circle 
the, the Carrizo Plain Count Circle, and that is going to be held on uh, January 2nd of 2021, Saturday. And uh, Kath Ann Lynch is the compiler for that particular count circle. And she, she has a number of people that are already signed up to participate in that. But if you uh, think you might want to participate in that, the uh, same COVID restrictions are going to apply. So it's like personal vehicles, unless you're in a, uh, in a family group and so forth. But uh, in any event, that's coming up. And I'm sure she would uh, appreciate it. She's got her uh, Gmail. Uh, up there. So uh, you can check the MCAS website and get more details on that. So uh, with that, I think I'll just turn it back over to Judy if, if anybody's still awake out there. So I I'm, I'm, think I'm done. My work We're, done here. We are all awake, Jay. Thank you so much to <laughs> Jay, Carol, and the, and the whole CBC crew that organized and pulled this off, went out birding, spent hours in the field. Um, there was a little bit of conversation as to whether we should cancel it. And I, I like what Jay said, which is, I plan on going out and, and hiking for my health. And if I happen to have a pair of binoculars on, <laughs> so much the better. So I'm really glad that we went, a whole, went ahead and did this. And I think we were completely safe. And uh, thank you, everybody that participated. Um, I'll just remind you that if you wish to become a supporter of Mora Coast Audubon and are not, go to our webpage, moracoastaudubon.org and click on the donate button. And other than that, I wish you a very happy solstice and new year and Christmas and whatever other types of things you celebrate. All right, thank you, Thank Judy. you all for coming. Right. And uh, we'll see you. We do not have a program in January. We'll see you in February. <laughs>